Welcome back. When we talk about the legacy of residential schools, one of the most glaring examples can be found in this country's foster care system. Recent data shows that while Indigenous children account for about 7% of the child population in this country, they make up more than 52% of the children in foster care. Our next guest is an advocate of inherent and treaty rights, and he's here to discuss this urgent crisis. Andre Baer, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So Andre, you make a direct link, a direct link between the residential school system and the current foster care crisis. Could you please explain that connection Absolutely. for us? Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say, Dance, Nuago Magante, Kitam Skate, Nawakakyo. I want to introduce myself in the Cree language and uh, thank you all for being here today. And um, we have to realize and understand that there are more Indigenous children currently in government care than there have ever been at the height of Indian residential schools. And so the goal of Indian residential schools was to kill the Indian in the child. And we see that same assimilation policy alive and well today uh, in the child welfare system. When I was 21 years old, I was appointed as an advisor to the federal government, and it was the cabinet minister of the Trudeau government who had taught me that the child welfare system has become an industry where the provinces actually profit off federal transfer payments based on how many kids that they apprehend. You just let that like sink in for a moment. Like that is, I, it's enormous. I don't think many people are aware of that. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, and this is this is personal for you. Your mother uh, is a survivor, a, a residential school survivor, and you were apprehended and put into foster care when you were very young. Um, you see no difference between those two realities, the foster care system and the residential system. Uh, talk about that. Sure. So my mom uh, was apprehended as well, and she was sent to Indian residential school. Uh, her parents were also taken uh, to Indian residential school. Their parents were taken. So my family was fragmented by this legacy. And not only that, but I see no difference in the way that I was ripped away from my mother's arms when I was four years old by a social worker and placed with a white family. And so we need to recognize how uh, the child welfare system is still assimilating Indigenous children today. And we need to make um, serious efforts to make that stop. And you, and you say that collective... And you also say that collectively, this country has been indoctrinated to allow this over-representation of Indigenous children in foster care. How so? Yes, I believe Canadians are indoctrinated to um, feel that Indigenous children are inferior. And I say that because of all the statistics that we see every single day about us being over-incarcerated, over-represented in foster care, um, racism in the healthcare or education systems. And so this happens every day and we are so desensitized to the information that's out there. And um, there are examples like birth alerts that are still happening in Saskatchewan where um, we, we, are thought, we are taught to believe that birth alerts were legislated out and that they no longer happen. But from working with First Nations chiefs in Saskatchewan, I know that they are still happening. Can you, can you explain yeah. what a birth alert is? So a birth alert is when an Indigenous mother is giving birth to a child and um, a fax is sent to the Ministry of Social Services, which um, alerts the ministry and they show up with a social worker and police and they take that child away from the mother before the mother can even see their baby. And so those things are still happening. And what we find in courtrooms today, um, the unfair conditions are placed on non-Indigenous parents who are adopting uh, Indigenous children. Where, because if, if they place a condition to, um, uh, to uh, remain connected to their culture, this will Im impact their adoptability. And so what had happens was, um, with Indigenous parents, when they want to keep their, ch their children, um, numerous amounts of conditions are then in placed on that child where it becomes impossible for them to uh, keep their children out of care. I just wanted to go back, so, um, um, because I think that you were making a point about the, the legislation to stop birth alerts. Yes. That 
was in place, but is it stopping the birth alerts? Yes, and so that's something that we need to identify in Canada is that even though it's been legislated out of Canadian law, um, they're still happening. Canadian courts still need to be held accountable for not upholding the law that is in place. And that is the same for uh, Bill C-92, an act respecting Indigenous children, uh, youth and families. If you ask the lawyers who are working in the uh, the provincial courtrooms, um, judges and courtrooms are still not hold, hold, upholding the law or Indigenous children's rights. Yeah. Um, you, uh, yeah. You advocate to ensure that when Indigenous children are taken from their families, that they can at least be placed with other Indigenous families mm -hmm. within their community. But that also poses a, a certain challenges. Absolutely. Why is that? Yeah. So we are detrimentally underfunded in every sector of government. And when you destroy the homes of Indigenous peoples, it becomes very difficult for Indigenous parents to raise their children. Um, that is why the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has recently um, f uh, found Canada guilty of underfunding Indigenous children. And they were found to discriminate against Indigenous children. And so this is why this legislation like Bill C-92 or this legislation to stop birth alerts are now being implemented. It's now about uh, courtrooms. Uh, we need to hold them accountable and ensure that they are following these laws and upholding the rights of Indigenous children. And um, we, ca we have to stop um, taking children away because they're in poverty. Even when you're poor, you still have a right to stay with your family. Andre, a large part of your advocacy work is advising First Nations governments, chiefs and councils on how to disrupt the cycle, the cycle that we have, we've spent a few minutes talking about, but it's obviously we could spend a lot longer. So what do you see as the best solution? Well, first of all, Indigenous children in Canada, we need good legal counsel because we are so overrepresented and um, the court dockets are full of Indigenous children being uh, taken from their families and placed into permanent care. And when those children have advocates in the room, the question of the court isn't um, how fast can we get this child adopted out of their family. The question becomes um, how can we, or it, the question becomes, okay, now this child has rights because there's a lawyer standing there next to, next to them advocating for them. So we, we need better advocates in the legal system and we need to understand that overall the system really doesn't work for us and um, now is an important time for Indigenous nations to start um, revitalizing our own laws, revitalizing our own legal systems to bring our children home. personal experience in the foster care system inform the work you do as an advocate for other Indigenous children? Yeah. So I still remember the day vividly of being ripped away from my mother when I was four years old. And uh, we were very poor because of the struggles that my mom had um, growing up through Indian residential school and coping with different things to try and uh, deal with her own trauma. And so uh, I think about the children that are out there that are still being ripped away from their families every single day. And when I advocate in this way, when I advocate um, in courts in the future, I think about those other children that are out there. And in some way, it's almost like I'm advocating for that four-year-old Andre, too. Yeah. You know, Andre, we can discuss the role of government and the courts in disrupting this cycle, but what is the responsibility of individual Canadians in this conversation? I had the same question with um, my hero, and my hero is Dr. Cindy Blackstock, and I had asked her, what could we do, what can Canadians do to change the lives of Indigenous children? And she told me, Canadians need to care. Canadians need to... Um, educate themselves and learn about the rights of Indigenous peoples, learn about how courtrooms are still taking them away from their families. We need to um, think about all of the kids that are still alive today. When you wear your orange shirts and you respect and honour those who are uncovered in the mass graves, please never forget that many Indigenous children are still apprehended in the foster care system and how this is inexplicably linked to the Indian residential school system. 
And so I invite all of you to educate yourselves, to learn more, to become advocates and allies. But most, in, most importantly, we need to care and love Indigenous children. Andre, thank you so much for being here today. I can only imagine um, this is how difficult this is for you to talk about on a regular basis. So we really appreciate your willingness to share, uh, not only with us, but the, with the rest of the country. So thank you. Thank you. Hey there, wasn't that great? Do you know where you can find some equally good content? Our YouTube page. It's filled with discussions, debates, and some laughs. Head there now, like and subscribe.